You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is writer, director, producer, Jonathan Gruber. And we are, Gruber, I'm sorry. And we're going to be talking about his new documentary, Upheaval, about Menachem Begin. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. Jan, for having me. I really appreciate it. it. It's a pleasure having you here. This is a... Uh, a, a really fascinating documentary. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot that I did not know before. Um, and I was very surprised to find out that this was the first English language documentary about Menachem Begin. And that was surprising. So there's been other documentaries done in other languages? There has not been much done in general. I think, you know, when, when this project first started, Rob Schwartz, our executive producer, was reading a book called The Prime Ministers by Yehuda Avner. And that talks about four Israeli prime ministers. Menachem Begin was the one that Rob really was fascinated with and then wanted, wanted more. And, uh, but there were no films out there uh, to see. And so he was the one who, uh, he's the inspiration, he's the visionary. Um, as it turns out, as we were making the film, there was a three-part series in Israel, in Hebrew, about Menachem Begin, but very different, you know, done differently and not, you know, I think they've turned it into a feature doc, but I think it was done more for an Israeli audience. A little, I like to say a little more inside baseball and it all mostly focused on his prime minister years, but nothing in English. We came across something while we were uh, looking for footage that had been done, I think in 92, that was a, for some reason, a Dutch English language documentary that was on television, but it is the first English language feature documentary on Menachem Big, just to qualify it. There you go. <laughs> well, it's he's he's the best. Uh, it's surprising to me because he's yeah. been dead almost thirty years, and he he's such an instrumental uh, person as far as history is concerned um, as far in Israel. And so I was surprised that nobody had done a documentary about him before. So that, it's, that, that in itself is rather interesting. Do, do you know why no one's bothered to do it before now? I don't know. I mean, he's a, he's a complex character, um, controversial in, in some ways, um, but that's not a reason to shy away. You know, if in fact uh, his story is, has, should have been told. I mean, it's been told, but not uh, not in this form. So I, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to be the, the person to, to tell his story. And you know that it's timely too. So perhaps, you know, it had to wait this long. Maybe the story oh. just needed to, you know, wait 30 years before his uh, story it really could be told in more detail for a, a different audience, the people who are not as familiar with him, who did not grow up knowing who he was. Um, I think that, you know, this is a broader audience, but with everything that's going on right now over in <laughs> that part of the world again uh, with Israel and Hamas, this is even more time. Well, it gives uh, people a sense of if you really want to understand Israel and its place in the Middle East and its relationship with its neighbors, this is uh, a good film to watch because it, it goes into the deep history of pre-state Israel, um, the fight for statehood, um, what was going on in the 50s, 60s, and of course the 70s when he was prime minister. And uh, I think it's important for, for people to understand that what we see today has a prologue and uh, to just jump in and not really understand it leaves people missing something. I agree. I definitely agree. And you're right. He's a very complex man. One of the things that uh, you wrote, you said, this film is a study in the gray. So do you want to explain to our audience what you mean by that? Sure. Um, well, uh, the thing that I wanted to do when I made the film was to tell this isn't uh, a hagiography. This isn't, you know, uh, idol worship. We're not putting him on a pedestal. Uh, it's about him as a man and, and in way a man who had flaws, um, a man who struggled, a man who overcame, a man who was a fighter, a man who was a lover, a man who, um, you know, spoke truth to power in many ways, but also made, made mistakes, tragic mistakes and resigned in disgrace. And, um, but still, tremendously worthwhile and but made peace and won the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, there's so many things in this in this film, you know, prevented civil war uh, in Israel amongst Jews. Uh, there's so many 
things on all sides that I think people hopefully hopefully can connect to. His relationship with his wife was beautiful, yes. um, you know, throughout all of this. So I I could go on and on, but maybe there's something specific that <laughs> <laughs> that you'd like to talk about. Well, it is good to go on. I, well, let's talk about you since you brought up his the relationship with his wife. Let's talk a little bit about that because, um, yeah, I mean it was almost when she died that kind of he that was he's I think at that point it really felt like he just decided you know that he was just going to go into a more um less public life and in and more inward perhaps I'm th I think if part of him died as well when she died so yeah that, I mean they were they were partners uh through so many things through um growing meeting each other as as she was a teenager i think she was 17 years old they were married a couple of years later they were split up during world war ii he went to the gulag in the soviet union was imprisoned and she went to palestine they were in the underground together hiding from the british um they, these are you know they 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 were forged in a way to each other and they went through this crucible together and so um when she died, I mean, what's so beautiful is that when he's elected prime minister in 1977, he's been trying to, to be the leader of the country for almost 30 years. He's run, this is his ninth time that he's running for prime minister, which just on his own, on its own is remarkable, yes, <laughs> crazy, yes, some yes, might say. Yes. Um, and the first thing he says at his victory speech is, the first thing I want to say is to my wife, and he reads a verse that uh, he modifies a little bit from Jeremiah talking about how they were in the wilderness and you were with me. And it's just, you know, that, that I think that to show his humility and his grace, and this is sort of the achievement of his lifetime is to, to first think about thanking his wife is really remarkable. So it makes sense that when she died, um, he really was, was broken. Do you think he was more broken I mean, obviously it was very broken, but because he wasn't there when she died? Well, I think that was a part of it. Yeah, the uh, for, for people who haven't seen it yet, or I'm not sure <laughs> uh, if they will, then uh, she, he was supposed to travel. He was prime minister and he was traveling to Los Angeles. She was sick and she urged him to go to this, to, to go to California and he, um, he went and she died while he was away and, and it was awful. And in, in the film, Hart Hasen, who's a, a good friend of Menachem Begin's said in Hebrew that he heard, he said, he, he Menachem Begin said, Lama uh, Zafta Otach. I think that that's how we say my Hebrew is not that great. Why did I, why did I leave you? Why did I leave you? And it was also a combination of, uh, I mean, his wife died. There, there was a horrific war in Lebanon that was going on that was, that was going south and uh, tragic results, civilians, soldiers being killed. And I think the combination is one of the journalists from Ben Ishai says in the film, uh, the combination of his wife dying in the Lebanon war forced him to resign. And I think that speaks again to, his, to, to who he was as a man, as a person who said, you know, I can't go on. I'm not just gonna hold on to power you know, as long as I possibly can, I don't, I don't think I can do the job anymore and I can't serve my people. And it says such a, such lessons for today, leaders who, you know, fail their people, you know, or just aren't, 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 aren't up to snuff anymore. And just knowing when to leave the stage is a huge, um, it's again, humility. And, uh, and he did that. And I, I wish that some, some leaders of today and anywhere would know, you know, my time is gone. I'm, I've, I need to, I need to take the blame responsibly, but um, Menachem Megan did. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, you know, yeah, that other people would take a page from his book and, and know when it's time to leave the stage. You know, some people stay too long at the fair, as they say. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what do you think? I mean, he, he went through so many things, but what do you think in, after doing this, what was the one, maybe that's a hard question to answer, but I'm going to say one defining moment in his life that shaped him for the rest of his life. Uh, to me, it was clear it was the Holocaust. And that was something that I wanted to make sure was in the film throughout. And you can, whether he's commenting about, he just says, there will not be another 
Holocaust when he's referring to Saddam Hussein having a nuclear weapons program in Iraq or negotiating with um, with Anwar Sadat for pe with peace in Egypt and saying like we can't give up this land because then it'll be that much closer you know the, it, the Holocaust could come so easily people could attack us he was constantly concerned about the Jewish people he grew up with anti-semitism in Poland he survived the war he survived the gulag he fought the British he fought the Arabs and it was something that lived with him and as Aharon Barak says in the film the former Supreme Court Justice and one of the uh, negotiators at Camp David, he said, we, we all live in the shadow of the Holocaust. And uh, my, my grandparents are all Holocaust survivors. And so it certainly resonated with me um, that this was something that was important, that people understand that when you look at Menachem Begin, and if you were to say, boy, that's a pretty hardcore thing that he's doing, you know, he doesn't seem to... Um, it comes from the Holocaust. These are these are intense reactions to trauma. And so whether you agree or disagree with him, at least it's hopefully a way that people can understand where these decisions were coming from. Exactly. And then, I mean, I don't know how you would ever not have that affect you, I would think, you know, and that's why it's so important that we don't let anyone forget about what happened, you know, um, what, you know, so many people are now into Holocaust denying, it just boggles the brain, you know, that people are even going there, you know. Um, so it's important that we don't forget what happened so it doesn't happen again. Um, well, ho Holocaust denial is really just one form of, of a bigger problem, which is anti Semitism in the yes. world. And, uh, and that's something that actually changed sort of the how I shaped the film. Uh, in the middle of the production, there were these. I think nine attacks over uh, Hanukkah in the New York region. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it, it became clear to me that Menachem Begin's fight against anti-Semitism is also our fight against anti-Semitism and that we should, uh, he he would stand up for, for Jews wherever they were um, threatened. And, that, and that's something that I think is a lesson that we can all learn that when anti-Semitism comes not to sweep it under the rug, but to just to say this is unacceptable. We, we, you know, and Jews, Jews deserve to live in safety and security where, wherever they are in the world. And there's so, it's not just, you know, there's anti, um, yeah, it's anti everything right now. It seems like, you know, the Asians, obviously black in America, it's just, seems like it's becoming a bigger problem rather than, you know, as, as time goes on, we would think that we would start to have healing process with all of this. And we're not, unfortunately. And it seems like it's getting uh, worse rather than better. Is that your perception also? Well, part of it goes to leadership. I mean, when you have leaders who unite as opposed to divide, then, then we'll do better. I think one of the things that Menachem Begin recognized was that in Israel, there's a, a, there was a divide between the European Jews, Jews of European descent, uh, the Ashkenazi Jews, and the Sephardi Jews, or the Mizrahi Jews, who came from the Middle East and North Africa. And there was tremendous discrimination against them. And he said, this is unacceptable. We, and he, he helped to not only bring them uh, into the more of the political standing, and they were part of his political base and helped to get him elected, but once he was elected, he poured all this money into these development towns where a lot of them had moved to from, from those Middle Eastern and North African countries and helped get them jobs. Actually, the end of our uh, film is uh, this beautiful song called Sion Tamati uh, by Rem Bashari. And uh, he was grew up in one of those development towns and the money of Project Renewal, which is what this whole thing was called, helped to pay for music lessons. Uh, for Rem. And so Rem has a real, has a direct connection to, um, to Menachem Begin. So that's a really nice story that we have in our film. It is the full circle moment. I love that. Mm -hmm. With, do you feel that he was ahead of his time that he welcomed, he, he not only welcomed the immigrants from, um, was it North Africa, but also Vietnam or the Ethiopian Jews and the Vietnamese refugees. Was yeah, he, 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 Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. No, no, no. I was going to say, do you think he was ahead of his time? And, and why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, he he was a refugee 
and so he understood what it was like to 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 flee and to not have a place to call home and so whether it was Ethiopia and he felt that all Jews had a place in Israel so whether it was Ethiopian Jews that he helped start the it was a secret program actually it's called there was this Red Sea Resort in uh, Sudan that took these um, Ethiopians and, and brought them to Israel. I just saw uh, a movie or, about that actually. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's uh, it was the first. There were these other ones that were later. Uh, these other operations where they were airlifted in, but this one was was top secret. It was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Or or whether he was agitating for Russian Jews who who could not get out of the Soviet Union, um, or even if it was Vietnamese, as you had said, there were Vietnamese boat people who were trapped on the South China Sea. And nobody wanted them. And Israeli, uh, I guess, shipping boats came and took them. And uh, and Menachem Begin said, "We will do like old, our old father Abraham. We will be good hosts, and we will take them in." And uh, so, whether he was ahead of his time or not, I I don't know. I'd like to think that that people have been accepting refugees for for millennia, but um, but he certainly did when he had the opportunity. He yeah. even and the other thing that I should say is he felt even Arab Israeli citizens um, should have equal rights, that after Israel became a state, the Arab villages were under military rule, uh, Israeli military occupation. And he said, that's not, that's not how they should be treated. They're citizens, they should have equal rights. So it's, it, you know, these are all things that whether, if people don't know about Menachem Begin, these are important things to know. If people know about Menachem Begin as some kind of right wing, you know, fascist or crazy person, they really should know about his democratic liberal values as well. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more about that. One of the, um, let's talk about Anwar Sadat and, and President uh, Carter and in the peace accords and the peace agreement. You, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I lived through that and I obviously that's one of uh, Carter's greatest legacies and I'm sure Menachem Begum's and Anwar Sadat, I mean, for all of them that's, something that they will be known for forever. So uh, you want to go in a little bit more detail about how that came about and, and just the way that you filmed that. You, you've got some wonderful footage, archival footage all the way around, and I do want to talk about that too. But Sure. Um, well, it, um, it came about, I think, through, strangely, the Romanian dictator, Nicolas Ceausescu, who, who reached out sort of behind the scenes to both Sadat and Begin. And then they were, I mean, mind you, this is just a few years after the Yom Kippur War and Egypt and Israel have had something like five wars and since 1948 and now we're in the mid seventies. So it was clearly not a good situation. And so these sort of back channel deals are happening. And then all of a sudden Anwar Sadat says in, in the, I guess the parliament, the Egyptian parliament, I'm ready to go to the Knesset and talk peace. And I think even his own people in Egypt in, in, the, in the parliament building themselves were clapping, they're clapping, but they don't necessarily even know what they're clapping for. And so all of a sudden this is a shock. And in Israel, they're like, did you just hear what Anwar Sadat said? Let's, and so Vegan says, let's invite him. So just a few days later, there's Anwar Sadat and he steps off the plane and he's in Israel. And it's, you know, for people who were there, I was, I was very young, so I don't remember it. But for people who were there, they, they said as one, Arye Naor, who was the Israeli cabinet secretary in the film says, it was like the footsteps of the Messiah. It's just hard to really comprehend how when you've been fighting for decades, all of a sudden there's this peace. It's just a beautiful situation. However, making peace is much harder than starting the peace process. And so eventually uh, President Carter, you know, stepped in and brokered, uh, helped broker a peace agreement at Camp David. And even after they signed that agreement, there were things along the way that had to um, happen for peace to really fully go through. But, um, but it's a remarkable achievement. And for you know, later Jordan in 1994, there was peace. And now with these Abraham Accords with four countries, um, the hope is the world is a better place when there's peace. The Middle East is a safer place when there's peace. And hopefully that improves everyone's lives by having peace. And so hopefully there can be more and not less. Yes. Yes. Let's say, let's say our prayers about that because it's really important. I have a friend who's over there right now during all of this 
is sort mm -hmm. of interesting. Yeah. So he's, you know, getting little posts, you know, to find out how he is and what's going on. And he's right, you know, right in the heart of it. So it's kind of interesting to have someone that you know that happens to be in the middle of uh, this conflict right now. But it sounds like they're going to be coming close to uh, some kind of a, a, a ceasefire agreement. Let's hope. Let's hope. I hope so. Yeah. So when you were filming this, what did, what did you learn that you didn't know before? What was the one thing that really you went, oh, I had no idea about that? Well, I mean, there were so many. It was really the opposite. It's the one thing I did know, which was about the Egypt, uh, peace with Egypt. Everything else was, I think the gulag in particular was was really striking to me that, that that's, he went off, you know, and, and actually, in theory, would have never come back had the Russians... Um, not been invaded by Nazi Germany. And then the Russians needed soldiers and he was Polish and willing to fight. And then he actually wound up getting an all expense paid ticket to Palestine because that's where his, his troop, you know, went to, they were fighting all the way, all the way through. Um, you had, you had asked a question before about the, the footage. And so I just wanted to talk about that, that our, our team, really did a remarkable job. We had um, two researchers in Israel and a researcher here, um, and they just hit it out of the park uh, in terms of what they were able to find. Um, even at the very end of the film, there's a scene where he's in the hospital where he hadn't been seen in eight years, and he comes out of seclusion after, as, as we had said, after his wife died and after the war and after he resigned. And I had heard that there was some footage that there was an interview that he had done. So that was something that was very rare, but just having him in his own words, we had an interview from the 700 Club from the Christian Broadcasting Network. There was an interview with Barbara Walters that he did on ABC. There was an interview with a, a rabbi, Alexander Schindler, who led the reform movement of rabbis. So just, and working with the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem, they had access to all of these things, which really just made it, so much easier in ways, but it was it was hard because we had so much of it. So the idea was let's be we have to be more ruthless with it. I mean, I I didn't put in things that were amazing. There's a 1948 radio um, interview of him on Meet the Press before Meet the Press even had television, but it just didn't work for the film. Um, and we were able to find lots of materials. And uh, there's a place in uh, at Vanderbilt University that has all these old news clippings or news reports so that when in the film people will see uh, election results and Walter Cronkite and Roger Mudd and David Brinkley and you know these really bring it a lot really to an English speaking audience I think. It's, 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 it's very well done and um, and I'm amazed by all the footage that you were able to, to locate um, to put this together, but obviously he was a public figure, but even back further, I mean, you have lots of pictures of him when he was younger and when he met his wife and, and that just brings the story all together. So, um, so what was the most difficult part of this, shooting this? The, the production wasn't the harder part. I mean, there's always challenges. I think the challenge was sometimes finding the right locations for people. We did sort of a, what I think is a little, it was unique for me at least, is we had three cameras and we had very wide shots of interviews. And so we had to find locations that could match, you know, that look, but, but compared to COVID, none of that was really a big problem. It was finishing the film in the middle of a pandemic. So that was, the biggest challenge that we had. And so we took us longer than we than we thought, but uh, we were able to finish our production about six weeks before COVID hit and uh, and we were able to make it through it's just a little bit longer. We couldn't sit in the room and I could say, cut that a little sooner. I'd have to write it and type it and have these long, long, long lists of changes. You so. were lucky. You were lucky that you just got it under the wire before things really changed in the world. Where can people find a people? Um, June 7th, so if you can remember, 6, 7, 8, June 7th at 8 o'clock Eastern Time on Facebook Live is a free premiere, one-time only event that you can see, and there'll be a Q&A afterwards with some of the people involved in the, in the film as well. And then June 9th, it'll be uh, virtual cinema, so people can watch it from the comfort of their own home. And uh, 
that's pretty much it. Look up uh, upheavalfilm.com and people have a hard time spelling upheaval sometimes. It ends in A-L, not E-L. So upheavalfilm.com. Great. I wish you much success with this. It's everyone, if you're a history buff, if you just want to know more about that part of the world and, and, and about this incredible, amazing man who um, it, you, we all have our, you know, strengths and flaws and, and you do show that in this film and, and, and it's really, really well done, Jonathan. So I wish you much success with it. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for having me on. Have a you. great day. You're welcome, you too. If you have missed any of the Jam Price Show's All About Movies, they are all archived on thejampriceshow.com. Also, you can listen at, on iHeart Podcast Network, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Jam Price Show. Thank you all for listening.